In previous sermons, we have studied and hopefully learned if we didn't already know them, and therefore we would have had them reinforced if we did, the following identifying marks of the Lord's church. The church of which you read in your own Bibles. That church was founded by the scriptural builder, Matthew 16, 18, Acts chapter 2, who is the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. That church was founded on the, the scriptural foundation, the Christ himself. It was founded in the scriptural place, the city of Jerusalem on the first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ. And again, Christ, another point, is the founder of only one, one single solitary church. And it's his church. He belong, it belongs to him. He purchased it with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. It is scriptural in name. We simply note Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. We're not saying that is the only inspired term the writers of the New Testament use to identify God's church. But we are saying it certainly shows a relationship of those Jesus saved to the Savior and vice versa. You have the church of God. You have the church of the firstborn ones. You have the body of Christ, you have the temple of God, you have the household of God. These are all scriptural terms of designation. No proper name, they just simply are terms of designation showing the relationship to the church, to the one who owns it or purchased it or who's head of it. It is scriptural in organization. When you read the New Testament, You'll find out that it is organized on a local level. There's no larger, smaller, organized entity of the one worldwide body of Christ than a church in any certain geographic location. And when it's fully organized, it has elders to oversee, to guide it, deacons to serve, evangelists, preachers of the gospel to preach and sound out the truth, and uh, teachers, of course, who are able to convey the message properly and every member doing what they can according to their several abilities to preach the truth and live it out in their lives and all the things that God charges the church to do, which pertains to benevolent activities, spreading the gospel, and each member edifying the other members. It has no human creed. It has the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice, a book that must be handled or right, or rightly divided, 2 Timothy 2.15, as that book is studied. And it's not studied properly if one does not handle it correctly. So of necessity, one must learn how to rightly divide the word of truth or to ascertain from the words of the New Testament the authority of our Savior, Jesus, in what we are to do, Colossians 3.17. It gives the scriptural answer to the question of what must I do to be saved. It does not act like there's nothing a person can do to be saved. It does not try to say there's something you can think up on your own and then do it and God will save you from your sins. It simply means that a man's a free moral agent. He has free will. And he must learn what God in his word has told him to do that his sins might be forgiven. And then he must then in faith, Romans 10, 17, comply with the will of Christ as set out in the terms of pardon all written in the New Testament of Christ. Thus, there's a great plan of salvation revealed in the Word of God that men must know and from the heart believe and obey, Romans 6, 17, and 18. It teaches that man is saved by faith. That's confidence and trust in God based upon the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. It is not faith only, James 2, 24, but it's a faith that always leads one to closely obey the teachings of Christ, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. Nowhere does the New Testament teach that a person outside of Christ lost in his sins is saved by faith only. Every passage in the New Testament says that uh, one is saved by faith. We agree because that's what the New Testament says. 
But none of those passages say, teaches that we are saved by faith only. In fact, James makes it clear we're not saved by faith only. Now, in this particular sermon, we'll note another mark of identification of the church that Jesus built and that he purchased with his blood and over which he alone reigns as head. And that is that in the worship, when it comes to music, the New Testament authorizes that those who worship him must sing. I say again, it's the only, only music authorized in the worship of God Almighty. It's not unusual for people in the denominational world where they do about anything in music to come into, if they do visit, an assembly of worship of the churches of Christ, churches that are faithful to the Lord, and see there's no mechanical instrumental music of any kind. So where is the piano? Where is the organ? Where is the stringed ensemble? Where is the harmonica or whatever else? Well, it's not there among faithful brethren in that auditorium dedicated for the worship of God and the teaching of the truth because it is not authorized in His Word. There is a principle set out by Jesus to the Jews, a principle that governs all religion in our worship to God. And in Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9, you'll find it. And it's typical of people in the Old Testament, a lot of people, and even in Jesus' day and up to the time being, and I'm sure to the end of the world. Of these people, here's what Jesus said. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. What happens in a case like that? He answers in verse 9. But in vain, vain means empty or worthless, but in vain do they worship me. Well, why is it vain? Teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men. So if you want your worship or anything else you do when it comes to your relationship to God to be worthless or empty or for him to reject it, just don't abide according to the teachings of his word. That seems rather, rather simple, but it seems to have been a problem since Mother Eve was tempted and yielded to the temptation to go contrary to what she knew God said. So in this passage, we notice that there are two kinds of worship. I pause here to interject this. The word uh, worship, Greek word, that is usually translated worship more than other words, predominantly used in the New Testament is proskuneo. And it means to engage in an act of kissing the hand toward. Among the ancient Orientals, they actually fell prostrate at the feet of another to do obeisance to that one. And that is where we have the idea of proskuneo, which is translated more than any other Greek word for worship. So we're talking about doing acts of obeisance to God in the very acts he's ordained for us to engage in that he says is worship to God. Now, there's only two kinds of worship in Matthew 15, 8, and 9. There's true worship and there's false worship. You know as well as I do that true worship is acceptable and therefore pleasing to God. Why wouldn't anyone, if they're going to take the time to worship God, if they see the need to do that, if they think of themselves as someone who wants to serve him faithfully and to show their devotion to God, to do obeisance before him, why then will they do otherwise other than simply comply with his will? But there's false worship. It's worthless. It's vain. It is that worship which is contrary to the teachings of the Bible. So true worship can be found when we humbly abide by the principles that we all know Jesus taught in John 4 and verse 24. God is spirit, and they that worship him must, underscore the word must, it's imperative, it won't work any other way, must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth, well, that's according to the truth. Jesus, remember, prayed, Father, sanctify them, set them apart. By thy truth, thy word is truth. So according to the truth means is the word of God directs you when it comes, in this case, to worship to God. Well, with the proper attitude, the proper frame of mind, the proper 
uh, perspective. Well, that's in spirit. It must come from the heart. That is, our mind is centered upon God, the object of our worship. And we're thinking about the words of the song. There are some songs that admonish one another. We admonish each other. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing, make a melody in our heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5 19. But it's all directed to God. One of the benefits we as worshipers, as we direct our worship to the Almighty, that we get out of it is that we're doing it together. It's a fellowship in worship to God. As brothers and sisters in Christ speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's wrong to teach that we may worship God according to the dictates of our own heart, yet that seems to be the governing factor in most all religion. If you're sincere, whatever you do, God's going to accept it. Well, how far, just how far from John 4, 24, that one must if worship God acceptably, must worship Him in spirit and in truth, how far can you get and accept by taking a view that we'll just do whatever you want to? No, that does not say we are at liberty to do as we please in worship to God or for that matter in service to God. And again, Colossians 3, 17 comes to mind Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Well, as far as I know, word and deed takes into consideration the worship of God in which we are to engage to show our homage to Him, our devotion to Him, our obeisance to Him. So why do churches of Christ that are faithful to the New Testament pattern, when it comes down to music and worship to God, sing only? Because the only kind of music found in any of the scriptures mentioning music in the New Testament has sing. And sing is a certain kind of music. If all he had said was make music, it would be left up to us to use all kinds of music. But he didn't, did he? The language has meanings. You specify with language. There's two kinds of music. There's singing. There's music of every kind, mechanical, etc. And he said sing. Search as you may and search as you ought the scriptures concerning worship in music, and you'll find only singing. So it's very important that we understand that in following Colossians 3.17, that we sing. Now if somebody says, I want to do something else, fine, where did Jesus tell you to do something else? I like what the old farmer said one time in his vernacular when the fellow said, well, where is your pan? And he said, we ain't got no Bible for it. And that's exactly right. We don't have any scriptures from Jesus Christ saying use any kind of mechanical instrumental music. And we're expected, as Paul said, even in this case, as all others, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. We are expected as faithful children of God, according to Peter, in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord in your hearts and be ready to give an answer, make a defense, apologia, Make a defense, give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that's within you with meekness and fear. So we should be able to know the Bible well enough to show why we worship God as we do. Where is our New Testament authority for any act of worship? So we must be able to fulfill those requirements of 1 Peter 3.15. Now, from Matthew chapter 1 to Revelation, the end of it, Revelation chapter 22, there is no mention whatsoever of mechanical instrumental music in worship to God. However, music in worship is mentioned ten times in the New Testament. And as I said earlier, in each instance, it's talking about singing. It uses the word singing. This being the case, then we need to think of some other passages that have a direct bearing on this as well as anything else we do in service to God or worship to God. Back under the law of Moses, Moses in the restatement of the law not long before his death, before they crossed the Jordan River led by Joshua, had this to say in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Now, does any honest person think that that applied only to the law of Moses and to the Jews and that Abraham under patriarchy could do what he please or we under the New Testament of Christ can do as we please? Or is that a principle that applies to all of the revelation of God to man which revelation was given to lead God and direct man in pathways of righteousness? 2 Timothy three sixteen and 17. Well, we go over to Proverbs chapter 30 
in verse number 6. And again we're admonished, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a, li found a liar. Who's a liar? A fellow that states a falsehood. Who's a fellow that states a falsehood? One that teaches that which the Word of God does not teach. And what's going to, God going to do with a person like that? He's going to reprove him. And what's God's view of a fellow like that? He's a liar. It's just that simple. If that doesn't cause one to be very careful in what he teaches, doesn't cause one to be caref very careful in what he studies, if it doesn't cause one to be exceedingly careful in just how he handles every word and every syllable of the Bible, then pray tell, what should he teach us? Then we come down to the closing words of the book of Revelation just before inspiration is about to cease. And John writes in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if a man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Now somebody says, well, that only applies to the book of Revelation. Well, you've already got Deuteronomy 4, 2 and Proverbs 30 and verse 6 and would only do what's authorized by the New Testament, which authorization is set out in the words of God and the seed of the kingdom is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. And it's uh, the truth. It's caught in the word of God and only in the word of God. So it sounds like to me it has to do with all scripture given by inspiration of God. And that's exactly what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So we cannot handle light and loose the Bible and just pretty well say, I really didn't really mean what he said. And especially so when it comes to the acts of worship and this particular act that is our study this morning as an identifying mark of the Lord's church. A faithful congregation of God's people is not going to be using mechanical instruments of music. They have no authority for it. And if you go to a church of Christ, it has that above the door. They're doing things like that. Just know they're not faithful. Either change them or get out. And that's the only thing to do. Well, you say, why can't I stay there? Well, you can't stay there and participate in their simple act. And it doesn't take very long to participate in the simple act when the whole congregation is worshiping God and they're doing contrary to the Lord's will. God looks very severely on those who would substitute for his way. Have we forgotten the Old Testament examples written aforetime for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4? Do we not remember Uzzah, who in the transportation of the ark, they didn't check the law as the way the law prescribed, specified that the ark was to be transported, so they built a new ark, they thought a, a new cart, they thought that'd be great, and used bullocks that never had been used before, that's honoring, that's left to their own thinking, and they put the ark on that. Well, the thing stumbled, and others are walking along beside. Just an innocent bystander. thing stumbled, and he went to steady it. God killed him right there for doing it. Why? He didn't do what God told him to do, and the way God told him to do it, for the reason God told him to do it. And all the way from David the king down through everybody, they all got upset. Well, it upset David, but it didn't change things. He had to go back and learn, as the rest did, just how the priests were to transport the ark by the staves that were put through the rings and the certain group that was to bury. it. And he says later on, um, God made a breach on us. Why did he make a breach on you? We didn't respect his word. We were not cautious in carrying out just exactly what God said. Why is that in your Bible? Why is it in anybody's Bible? Especially when Paul plainly says it's written for our learning. What do I learn from it? I better do only what's authorized, even down to specific kind of music God wants. But we all know about Nadab and Abihu, priests of God, sons of Aaron, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. They offered strange fire before the Lord. Well, that's a way of saying it was strange to the fire authorized by the law of Moses. And when they did so, God killed them. Do those things just take up space, or does it say, He may not kill you right now, but what did you get the day of judgment? Then you get to enter the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death, and it's the eternal death. So we got time now, don't we? The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. A general statement that pertains to anything God obligates us to do in his word. He's giving us time to learn from passages 
that contain these examples, negative examples. We shouldn't do them like Uzzah did or Nadab and Abihu did. The law of exclusion proves mechanical and instrumental music in worship is unauthorized. It is sinful. One of the major arguments that is used in favor of mechanical and instrumental music in the worship is this. Well, the Bible does not say not to. Well, the Bible doesn't say specifically that it's wrong to use cocaine. You find in the Bible where it says, Thou shalt not use cocaine as a recreational drug. I suppose that means, since it doesn't say it like that, that we all can go out there and do that, or anything else it does not precisely and specifically say. The Bible does not explicitly say that it is wrong to beat our wives. Or we might say nowadays, are the wives to beat their husbands. But does that make it all right either way? Well, I can't conceive of either spouse wanting to be beat by the other one. Like the old fellow said one time, said I was on my knees to my wife all morning long. Saying, or she was on her knees to me. I believe that's the way it goes. Nowadays, it really doesn't make any difference if you even know you're a man or a woman. You've got problems there, too. And uh, she was saying, come out from the bed and fight like a man. Well, regardless of how jokingly we make it to make our point and to keep something really branded in our mind, the point is there is a law of inclusion. If it is authorized, it's included. If it's not authorized, it's excluded. And when singing and worship is included by authorization and there is no other authorization saying use mechanical instrument music, then that's excluded. The law of exclusion is a law that we use every, in every area of our life every day. And it's something we understand. I've always used this in this sermon. We have a restroom. We define restroom. We know primarily if you go to England, you'll say toilet. You don't have to define as much. But a restroom is what we call them over here. Now, what do we have on the doors of our restroom? Designating who is to use which one. We have something that says female, lady, girl, woman, or male, man, boy. And supposedly people who are mature enough to read and understand what that means, in our situation, in context, it means this is a toilet for the male of the species to use. And this is a toilet for the female of the species to use. Authorization for the male, authorization for the woman. Why does the male go over here and use the one that says woman? There's no authorization. And if you want to see the law of exclusion, just go prating in there and there's several women in there and you'll learn forever the law of exclusion. Now, we have to sometimes be a bit ridiculous to make a point that we use every day. When you're ordering in a restaurant or cafe, you don't have to go down through there and say, I don't want this, 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 this. You specify what you want based on the words of the menu. Difficult. When you send kids to the store, well, assuming the kids will mind you, we have to assume certain things. When you send kids to the store, or you might say husbands, you have to understand they have to learn to mind too <laughs> as to how they carry out the wife's wishes presented in her words as to what she has ordered from the store. You don't begin, nobody does, by saying not to. You go on the basis of what's specified on the grocery list. Uh, you have biblical examples of exclusion. Old ones we've used. The building of the ark, Genesis 6. What kind of wood? Go for wood. Why didn't they use some other kind of wood? God said go for wood. He didn't say any other kind of wood. Now, if he had said gopher wood plus pine, then they could have used gopher and pine. But he would have specified gopher and pine. But he didn't specify gopher and pine. He specified gopher, period. There's no other authorization for any other kind of wood. So it's excluded. Could have used oak, but it would have been specified. It would have been vain as far as what it would accomplish that God intended to with the ark. Same thing's true of the Lord's Supper, Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Why not coffee and pecan pie? Didn't say not to. 
Because when you take the totality of the evidence on the Lord's Supper and the elements that make it up, it comes to unleavened bread representing the body of Christ and fruit of the vine representing the blood of Christ. And that's what's specified. Those are the emblems making up the Lord's Supper. Now, we've got a bunch of folks that's been around for a good many years in the Church of Christ. They're apostate, so listen to them. They're teaching false doctrine. Don't listen to them. And they'll say, the New Testament is not a divine pattern. It is a love letter. Well, I can define it to be a love letter. It's God's love letter to us telling us how to be saved, but he expects us to do what he said when he loves us enough to give us his instruction so we can learn it, James 1.25. But they're saying it's just really a narrative that tells about God's love for lost mankind, and it causes us to realize we can't save ourselves or whatever we think sin is, and we look to God and cry out to save us, and that's as far as you're able to bind anything. Well, I'll go so far as to say this. Why bind that? God's all-knowing, isn't he? He's a God of love, isn't he? Doesn't he already know the mess I put myself in? So why should I even have to call on him? Doesn't that belittle God to have to call on him? I mean, he already knows. So when you start that kind of stuff, it just simply is trying to say God's going to save you no matter what you do or what you think. Just so you wave at heaven. No, the Bible is plain in the words that make it up, and they were given for a reason to tell us God's will for our lives as the free moral agents we are, and that's the way He made us. He gave us a mind to understand, and He expects us to study and understand it and abide by what He teaches. You couldn't have John 12 48 if you didn't. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, these same shall judge him in the last day. Thus, when God said, sing, and that's all that he said, there's no authority to use mechanical instruments of music, and thereby they are automatically eliminated because there's no authority for them. That also rules out uh, any kind of mechanical instrument of music, if I've already said, but it also rules out humming. Brethren, do you not know that humming is not singing? Because the kind of singing that you've got in Ephesians 5, verse 19, and Colossians 3, 16, teaches with the meaning of the words that you sing. You could get up here, hmm, 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 all day long, and what have you understood? Nothing. Unless you already knew the words of the song to begin with, and somebody would have had to teach you that, or you have to have it written down. What does it do when people get up, and the a cappella vocal band, and they make mechanical instrumental sounds with their mouth, and they say because it was made with our vocal cords in our mouth, then it must be acceptable to God. You can't find that to be defined as singing. It's not singing. It's mimicking a saxophone, or it's mimicking whatever else you want it to make. There are no words to convey a message at all, either extolling God or admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. There's no authority for it. If instrumental music in worship is scriptural, why was it not used in the first century among inspired men? And try as you must, and you must try, or as you may, you won't find it in the first century, and you won't find it in your New Testament. And if the New Testament is not the primary source for Christianity, what's it going to be? Instrumental music in worship was first introduced by Pope Vitalian in 670 A.D. But do you realize it was rejected by the churches for the most part? When we use the term a cappella, it means the singing done in the chapel. And it was so routinely singing and singing only that a cappella to this day means there's no mechanical instrument music used with the singing. In 757 A.D., an organ was finally brought, to, brought in uh, pretty much to stay, at least in the bigger places, by Constantine Coproninimus, named like that, he needed something. Thus, mechanical instrumental music in worship was not even used until over 700 long years after the establishment of the church of which we read in the New Testament, and it cannot be identifying mark of the church. If you go into the old uh, cathedrals in Europe to this day, and I'm thinking right now particularly, of the Peterborough Cathedral in Peterborough, England, built about 1,000 A.D. You will see that the uh, organ loft looks very much out of whack. 
because the architecture of the original building didn't have an organ loft in it, and they had to put it in afterward. And if you look at all of those old cathedrals, you will see that none of them were built with an organ in it. They came along later and put it in there. And let me remind you again, even when they authorized it, the people were very, very, very slow, even the clergy, quote, quote, to accept it. So all those years passed from the first century in the New Testament teaching before people began to do it. And I want you to notice some of the various religious leaders of the past and what they say about the use of mechanical instrumental music in worship. John Calvin. One of the founders of Presbyterian Church says, and I'm quoting, musical instruments in celebrating the praises of God would be no more suitable than the burning of incense, the lighting up of lamps, the restoration of the other shadows of the law. The papists, therefore, have foolishly borrowed this as well as many other things from Jews. Pretty good statement about how a lot of things got in the Catholic Church. For the rest, they borrowed a lot from pagan philosophers of the Greeks. John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist Church, said, quote, I have no objection to instruments of music in our chapels, providing they are neither heard nor seen. And Martin Luther said this of the Lutheran Church, of course, and by the way, they didn't call it the Lutheran Church after he was dead because he didn't want it called after him. And he called the organ, and this is a quote, quote, the organ an instant of Baal. Adam Clark, one of the older Methodist commentators, says, quote, music as a science, I esteem and admire, but instruments of music in the house of God, I abominate and abhor, unquote. Why did those fellows say that? Because they were close enough to the time to where they realized when they stuck close to the scriptures, such was not found in church history for hundreds of years after the church was established, and they knew it wasn't in the New Testament. Instrumental music in worship was not authorized in the first century, and neither is it today. I think that'd be a good uh, proposition for debate, in fact, when I um, might adjust it some to make it fit the proposition better, but that's what we're saying. When many are asked why they use mechanical instrumental music in worship, you know what the real reason is, and they're honest. That's what the real reason is with a lot of people. I just like it better that way. That seems to be the approach most people take to serving God. I just like it better that way. And you can find it even in the Lord's Church today because with the move away from the authority of the Bible and authority in general in the nation and the general disrespect for anybody in authority, then you'll find people are going to do as they please. There was no king in Israel, and the people did that was right in their own eyes. Since... When are our likes and dislikes to be authority when it comes to serving God? I like coffee. I like shrimp. Jody doesn't like shrimp. She's an apostate. Uh, I, no, she's not an apostate. She never liked it. Uh, she needs to go with Ken, who thinks it's poison, and it is to him. But see, now, if we're going to do this just like we like it, she would need it. He would need it because detrimental to him. I'd eat it. So we could all eat shrimp to the glory of God, except some. They <laughs> say, that's so silly and so stupid an example. No, it's not. When you start doing things just because you like it, because it suits you, because it appeals to you, tell me what's silly about it. There's nothing. That's where we're led to. Everybody doing that, which is right in their own eyes. I just like it better that way. Well, what I like has no weight with God in religion. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 8, the great messianic prophet said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. Well, what does that mean to me? It means I better listen to what he says. Because I can't see things as God says it unless I know his word and I follow it. God's ways are higher than our ways. Thus, whose way should we abide by? The way of the creator or the creature? In Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. I can't direct myself in and of myself. I must have revelation from the mind of God as to how I'm to live on this earth. 
and as a free moral agent, I must be honest of heart and determined to study it, learn how to write and divide it, and learn the will of the Lord for my life and give my life to obey it rather than disobey it. Revelation 2.10. We have no right to direct our own steps. Proverbs 14, 12, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We must do as God likes and not as we like. Somebody might say, Well, David, a man after God's own heart, used mechanical or instrumental music and worship under the old law, so why can't we? Well, try that on your wife when it comes to having multiplicity of wives. He did that too. He was under a different law, wasn't he? That law has been nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28 and verse 18. His will is revealed in the words of Christ, the perfect law of liberty, James 1 verse 25. It will be the one that will judge us. David will not be judging us under the law of Moses on that day. It will be the will of Christ. David burnt sacrifice to the Lord and worship. Does that mean we're to do that? We have no authority from Jesus to do it. Burning incense, anything else you want to talk about? Uh, worshiping on Saturday. You see a lot of denominations you used to know better than this. Now they remove themselves so far from the truth that they'll assemble on various days. They'll go to church on Saturday or whatever. They don't have any concept of what the Bible has to say or how to write and divide it to learn the will of heaven. So what David did or anybody else like that is not the point in any form or fashion or to any degree. In the Christian dispensation, we are under the new law. We are under the last will and testament of Jesus Christ, the New Testament. And we must find our authority for what we do in religion today from Jesus as His words teach us in His perfect or complete law of liberty, James 1.25. And as I say again, to leave it here, the law of Moses was taken out of the way and nailed to our Lord's cross. We are under the authority of Christ in the words of the New Testament, Colossians 2.14. So what shall we say? Well, we're to sing and sing only and worship to God and His Son's church. We're to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We're to make melody in our heart. It's directed to God, and we all benefit from it because we're of the same mind and the same judgment to abide by the revealed will of heaven and nothing else. So the words of Jeremiah come to mind. Jeremiah 6 and verse 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But the sad part about it is, is what many people do today, which was what the people did then when this was read or it was stated, but they said we will not walk therein. Colossians 3.17, doing only what's authorized, still is there. It will read that way on the day of judgment. And if we worship God acceptably when it comes to music, we will sing and sing only and that's all we will do because that's all the Lord told us to do. And we have faith in Him and His system and not ourselves. If you're not a child of God today, then we appeal to you by the mercies of Christ to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Him. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if in your life maybe you've um, drifted from some of the things we said in your own personal living, and we urge you to repent of whatever sin may be there. Confess it and pray to God for forgiveness. And what better time than now, because it's all we have, to straighten our life up if we need to, while together we stand and sing.